to you about where did I come from? And this is especially dear and near to my heart because I'm going to talk to you about evolution and creation. And I should tell you right up front, I'm doing this with my personal perspective. My doctorate is not in biology. I'm going to be sharing with you from personal experience. Now, I, I gave a little bit of my testimony last night. And while I went to 14 different schools before I ever got my GED and then went on to college, many of those schools taught evolution. I was a firm believer that we just evolved because I had heard it so many times. But you know, in the back of my mind, I, I found I had to torture my logic to accept it. But I thought everybody believes it. And you're, you're looked upon as foolish if you don't believe it. And even though I had a hard time understanding how you could get all of these intricate organizations and systems and design and structure through random chance, I figured, well, I'm just not smart enough. There must be things that the science is just not explaining about how it happens or that I don't quite understand yet. But, uh, you know, then after I, I shared with you, I went to the mountains, I started reading the Bible, I came to believe the Bible, and for a while there, I tried to mix the Bible with Eastern religions, with reincarnation, and with evolution. I said, you know, Jesus had a lot of very important things to say, and I think there's a lot of truth in what he said. And uh, so I, I tried to just make it all fit, but, you know, I couldn't make it fit. Where did we come from? What you believe about that will affect everything in your worldview. Your belief about origins will define every other belief. Your worldview about where you came from is going to have a defining influence on every other belief. Let me give you just a couple of examples here. What you believe about death is going to be affected by whether or not you believe in evolution and creation. If you think we evolved, then you think death is the dead end, you've just sort of decomposed and that's it, you cease to exist. What you believe about sin and holiness is going to be greatly influenced by that. What you believe about marriage, I'll never forget, I went to this school, it was uh, called a free school. It was a very liberal school in Waterford, Maine called Pine Hinge. It has since closed. And just almost anything went. It was like hippie school, is the best definition. And we were in the cafeteria one day, and one of the faculty came in, and she was crying. She tried to hide it. She was pregnant, and she was crying. And I just overheard as some of the other girl students were talking to this teacher and saying, what's the problem? And she said, she just broke down and said, my husband's having an affair with another faculty member. And she said, uh, He's a science teacher, and he said, this should not bother her because we're all animals and this is perfectly normal behavior. And so I remember thinking to myself, logically, if I believed in evolution, what he was arguing made sense. There's no morality if there's no God. Your idea of morality is not worth a nickel more than mine if there's no God. Who defines what's right and wrong? Every country and every culture can just make up their own rules. But if there is a God, and if he is the truth, then there's absolutes. It'll define what you think about marriage, whether or not there's a day of rest, the inspiration of Scripture, the words of Jesus. It'll affect everything from adultery, homosexuality, suicide. It'll affect your views on racism, what you believe about evolution and creation. You know, people talk about Darwin's book, Origin of Species, and they stop right there, but that's not the whole title of the original book. You know what the whole title of the original is? The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. When Darwin went to Australia, he was convinced the Aborigines there were somewhere on the continuum of the missing link. That's where that's going to lead. But you know, in the Bible, let me read something to you from Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, and this is Paul. He's in Athens. It was the center of learning back in his day. And he's waiting for his friends to come, and while he's waiting, he's wandering around the town, and, and he just saw there were idols everywhere, and they had so many idols, they made an idol to a god they didn't know who he was. They just wanted to make sure they didn't leave any gods out. Very pluralistic 
culture back there among the philosophers in Athens. It says in verse actually 21, for all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but to tell or to hear some new thing. Lots of philosophy. You got your truth, I got my truth, there's nothing absolute. Then Paul, he stood in the midst of the Areopagus and he said, men of Athens, I perceive in all things that you're very religious. For I was passing through and I considered the objects of your worship. I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one that you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. I happen to know that one that you don't know. Let me tell you about him. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with anything, since he gives life to all and breath to all. And notice, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and he has determined their pre-appointed times and their boundaries of their dwellings. Notice why. So they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. No, he's not far from every one of us. He is not far from every one of us. Every one of us, he's not far. But he says, he created us. We're caught in this quandary of sin. Talk about that in our next presentation. And he wants us to seek for him. We need to understand what the ultimate purpose of life is. Well, let me give you a few reasons that I believe that evolution is impossible. And I'm not gonna have time to cover them all. But, um, among the reasons are the laws, first and second laws of thermodynamics and entropy. Now, I know many of you are studying these things now, and I'll just give you the very simple definition. For instance, the first law of thermodynamics, energy can be changed from one form to another, but it cannot be created or destroyed. You've all heard that before, first law of thermodynamics. In other words, there's only so much matter and energy in the universe, and it can be altered. You can turn matter into energy and energy into matter, but you cannot create new energy or matter. Well, we see there's a lot of energy and matter in the universe. Here's the big question. Where did it all come from? Everybody, evolutionist, creationist, is going to be stumped at this point. And you've got two options. You can believe that all of the life and the organization and structure that we see in the universe is the result of ever-existing gas particles that somehow collided and began to explode. And through an infinite number of very convenient small explosions or one great big explosion, followed by a lot of smaller explosions and things spiraling off into galaxies, that all that you can see, all the interworking perfect systems, the earth, the perfect distance from the sun so that we don't melt or freeze, and the perfect cycle in the ecosystem between the, the plants and the animals and the symbiotic relationships between everything from ants that take care of aphids and, and uh, bees and flowers, and there's so many mysteries out there. You can believe all that is a result of matter that was collided and exploded and you don't know where the matter came from. Every evolutionist will say, well, uh, 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 something was always there, right? Or you can say, I don't know where God came from, but I believe that there is this ultimate supreme intelligence that lives somehow in and outside of time and space that is from everlasting to everlasting, and he is much bigger than I am, but he's made me in his image, and the Bible reveals who he is, and he has feelings and emotion and thought and love. You can believe that or you can worship gas particles. Now, some are going to say, well, Pastor Doug, I believe in a creator, but I also believe in evolution. I think that God created through evolution. Have you heard that before? And you know, I don't want to insult anybody here. I've got dear friends that believe that, but I would respectfully disagree with them. I don't think you can reconcile the two. Some people struggle with the first 11 chapters of the Bible and they say, up until you get to Abraham, God spoke to us through myths. And those things aren't to be taken literally. They're just, they're symbols, they're stories. They're, it's not science. But you're gonna have a problem with the rest of the Bible if you don't believe in a literal six-day creation. 
Let me just give you a few verses that explain why. First of all, if you're going to believe in Jesus, if you believe anything that Jesus says, if you can say, I'm a Christian and I believe in God, but I still believe in evolution, do you really believe in Jesus? Listen to what he says. John 5, 46 and 47. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Could that be any more plain? You say, oh, I love the Sermon on the Mount, but I don't believe, you know, Moses, Moses was, you know, exaggerating or you can't really take those first 11 chapters. He was stretching the truth. Oh, really? The guy who gave us the Ten Commandments that you claim to believe was stretching the truth when he wrote the first 11 chapters. It doesn't work. You can't do the two, not in my opinion. Again, Luke 16, 31, Jesus is speaking. If they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though run, one should rise from the dead. You'll probably have problems believing the resurrection too if you don't believe that God can speak things into existence. You know, one of the reasons that I think people struggle with evolution, it's the dating methods that give them such a hard time. Oh, I want to give you some more verses before I get to that. You can't believe Paul. I just read Paul in Acts, but here's another one, Romans 5.14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is a figure of him who was to come, Jesus. Paul speaks about Jesus as real, and he speaks about Adam as real, and he said sin began with Adam. If you think that there were millions of years of animals killing each other and death and mutation and bloodshed and violence and, and carnivores and then along comes Adam and he sins. Uh, the Bible tells us that sin began with man. It didn't begin millions of years before man. And you know, <clears throat> no disrespect, I used to go to Catholic school. Uh, you know, the Catholic Church for some time now has said that evolution is an option for uh, dedicated Catholics. And, I think, how do you do that? They say, well, at some point along the way, God injected a soul into man. And I'm just trying to picture that day when man went from being a gorilla to being a human. And, you know, he's, just, he's out there dragging his knuckles. <laughs> and there's some little spark. He looks up and all of a sudden God says, all right, now you're a man and you got a soul. Up till then, you were just an organism. You know, I just don't, that doesn't really do much for my self-esteem, for one thing. And it just doesn't seem very noble, and it contradicts the Bible. I don't have a problem believing that God can speak things into existence. You know, let me look at really quick a few examples of why I think the dating dilemma is something that we need to consider. We are told, for instance, that uh, dinosaurs did not live contemporaneous with man. And they lived millions and millions of years before. You know how long a million years is? Can you ever comprehend how things can change in a million years? Look at what's happened in our lives. Just what's happened to the environment in our time. Millions of years. And they say that these uh, dinosaurs lived 65 million years ago. Well, uh, back in 1990, in the United States, they found, they were actually dissecting the thigh bone of Tyrannosaurus rex and they found what appears to be soft tissue and blood cells. And it just caused kind of an implosion in the paleontology community because there is nothing in their scheme that would explain how you could get a Tyrannosaurus thigh bone that is 60 million years old, doesn't matter, 30, 60, 100, that's still gonna have soft tissue in it. And they were beginning to wonder if they could get some sampling from those blood cells and they started talking like Jurassic Park, you know, all over again. By the way, let me read this to you. This is from National Geographic, hardly a creationist magazine. A Tyrannosaurus rex fossil has yielded what appears to be the only preserved soft tissue ever recovered from a dinosaur taken from a 70 million year old thigh bone. The structures look like blood vessels, cells, proteins involved in bone formation, National Geographic. Then folks will say, well, we know how old the planet is because we, we take these ice cores in Greenland and at the Antarctic, and we can look at the different layers in the ice cores, and each of those layers represents one year, you know, a season, and, 
And so we find that there's anywhere between 80,000 and 130,000 layers, and we know that the polar caps in Greenland has been there for 130,000 years. So how could you believe that's the craziest manipulation of evidence I've ever seen? Let me give you a couple of examples why. I've lived in some very cold places, and I've seen in one snowstorm on top of a car lots of different layers because the snow came down cold and then it got a little warmer and it came down wet and then it froze during that night and there was a layer and more snow came down and you see how many of you have seen that before you know what I'm talking about layer after layer and they're trying to perpetrate that all these layers represent a whole year now that's easy for me to say that but let me give you a little evidence any of you ever heard about the lost squadron 1942 six p-38s were coming from the United States going to the war effort World War II in Europe over Greenland with two B-29s, brand new planes. They got lost in bad weather over Greenland. They finally realized rather than crash land, they'd circle, they'd uh, do emergency landings. Most of them did it with their gear up. One left his gear down, he flipped. But they were all fine, 25 crew members. They were all rescued, but the war was going on. They were all redeployed. They left all those planes up there in Greenland, out in the middle of nowhere, but they marked the longitude and the latitude. Well, they got covered quickly by snow by the time the war was over, and they weren't easy to locate. Years later, some aviation enthusiasts went looking for the lost squadron because they thought those planes, they were brand new from the factory. If you could find them and recover them and restore them, they'd be worth a fortune. Well, they spent a fortune finding them. They finally got this ground-penetrating radar, and they went back and forth. They found out that they had drifted about a mile from where they landed because the cap was moving. And they bored down with this hot mole. It was a big thing with hot water going through it. It just would bore right down into the ice. You know how deep those planes were? 260 feet deep in exactly 50 years. And in that 260 feet, there were thousands and thousands of layers in the ice that evolutionists would say, those planes are about 50,000 years old. Well, they were not 50,000 years old. They actually went down there. They built a cave around one of them. They took it all apart, pulled it up at great expense, reassembled it. It's the only perfectly restored P-38, um, and it's, uh, they call it right now the Glacier Girl. I think there's a picture of it up on the screen. So you've got, and then they, you know, they talk about the, the ice cores. And then you've got um, these animals that they claim are extinct like the coelacanth, they said that this fish lived between 300 million years ago and became extinct 65 million years ago. And they said it was one of the missing links in the evolutionary process because it had these little proto legs and it would try to walk up out of the beaches onto the land. And they had this whole scenario written up about the coelacanth fossils that they found and that they're all extinct now until they were fishing off of South Africa in 1938. And you know what happened? Uh, they dug up a coelacanth. They pulled up a live one. Since then, they found many more. And you know, the amazing thing was, it was exactly like the fossils that are supposed to be 65 million years ago. As far as I know, they're still alive in the world today. I lived in Nagizi, New Mexico, on the Indian Reservation at 8,000 feet in the middle of North America, and there were seashells everywhere. And then I've got friends who say you can find seashells on Mount Everest at the 26,000 foot level. There are clams that all died in vast volumes. They're closed, which means they died suddenly. What are they doing there on Mount Everest? All around the world, from the Grand Canyon to so many other things that you see, the coal fields and the oil, there's evidence that, that there has been a massive global flood. And you know, for years, scientists said, oh, that's just, no, that's, fairy tales, Bible, there's never been a global flood, but the evidence after evidence, all the fossils are, things died rapidly. So finally they said, it wasn't Noah, it was an asteroid. <laughs> well, what'd the asteroid do? Big flood. <laughs> That's exactly what they say now. They even tell you it landed near the Gulf, in the Gulf of Mexico. Have you heard that before? And then there's, you know, they, they say, well, we can date rocks. And we use potassium argon, a number of other methods to date rocks. And, uh, but you don't hear them confess that they will date these volcanoes and say, yeah, this is you know, this many million years old. And then some who challenged 
these uh, geologists who are testing the rocks, they say, well, we've got brand new rock formation here in New Zealand or in Greenland, let's test that. And they go to test a new formation there in New Zealand and they actually can, uh, they had this one formation that was surrounding trees that they knew the trees had been there for a thousand years, volcanic flow had covered these trees that uh, were a thousand years old. And uh, the volcanic rock came up at um, 465,000 years old according to their potassium argon dating and the uh, other, I, I understand, very sophisticated methods they use for dating it, but they get these vastly different measurements. I've got a friend who was an evolutionist, worked in a dating lab, and one of the questions people will ask when they submit some artifact is basically, how old do you want it to be? You know, you know how they tell how old the different layers are in the strata? Based on the fossils that are found there. You know how they tell how old the fossils are? Based in the layers where they find them. So it's kind of like circular reasoning. For me, you know what I think one of the most incredible things is? You're going to think, oh, Pastor Doug, you're getting sappy. A butterfly. I mean, just take, you've heard it before, the monarch butterfly. To me, how you can have this little egg tiny, almost like a pinhead, underneath a leaf. That butterfly knows that it's only on that plant it can lay its egg. Where, how does it know that? Who teaches it that? Out of the thousands of plants in the woods, it knows it's the milkweed. That thing hatches out. Mom's provided that it's born right where it needs everything it needs. It eats voraciously. And while it's eating voraciously, day after day, it's, it's gaining a lot of weight. Just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's growing so fast, it grows out of its own skin and it molts and sheds its skin several times and it burgeons out, splits it, and as it comes out of its skin, it's just a bigger caterpillar and it's a brighter caterpillar and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But then one day something happens in its mind, it triggers and it says, all right, this next molt is going to be different. And it lodges itself underneath the leaf and it turns into a chrysalis and begins to harden. And you know what happens at that point? It basically disassembles itself and it turns into a soup of cells. And it goes from the mush that the caterpillar had inside, that by the way, a bird can't eat because milkweed's poisonous, and so it even protects itself by eating what it eats, but somehow it thrives on it. And uh, it basically decomposes into this virtual soup and those cells restructure and reorganize and they come back together in just a matter of a few days and all of a sudden now where it had these little stubby little rubbery legs it's got the, these elegant long legs and elegant wings and antenna and beautiful coloring on the wings and a proboscis and instead of now eating milkweed it goes for sweet nectar its digestive system is different it's got eyes that are different its brain is different it completely reforms itself and it emerges knowing how to fly and it never gets you know an eagle teaches its young how to fly they get flying lessons it emerges knowing how to fly no flying lessons aerodynamic design could that be an accident? But wait, there's more. Get your credit card out and we'll double, no. <laughs> <laughs> then the monarch, the ones that are born in the Northeast, they are born with the ability to migrate 2,000 miles all the way to Mexico. And they have never been there before. Their parents have never been there before because the generations that come back from Mexico several generations happen along the way back to their ultimate destination in the north. They don't know any other butterflies that have ever been to Mexico. They don't know how to go online and book a trip to Mexico. <laughs> and somehow they find their way back to this place in these remote mountain woods in Mexico where they spend the winter. It's called a super generation. They somehow survive. And how could that ever happen by accident? You know, for me, metamorphosis is such a miracle. How God can take something that is a, it's basically a worm, 
and turn it into this beautiful, elegant creature. And what he does for a butterfly, he can do for each one of you. I know, that sounds very simplistic, but it's a miracle. I can't explain it. Except the Bible tells us that in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. I believe that. And you know what works for me? My whole worldview makes sense based on the Bible, that there is a creator. And I believe that he's got a special plan for each one of you. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Prophecy Code video series. The USA in Bible Prophecy. Turn in your Bibles with me, please. Revelation 17. I'm going to do a little reinforcement on that first beast and then go to the second beast because she's mentioned here. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me saying, Come here, come hither, and I'll show you the judgment of the great whore that sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet-colored beast. What color? Scarlet. Who, with uh, names full of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, and the woman is arrayed in purple. What color? And scarlet adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead, boy, forehead comes up a lot in Revelation, doesn't it? On her forehead was written a name, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now, do you really think there's some woman walking around in the last days who's got this whole paragraph in her head, dressed like this, riding on a beast, or is this obviously symbolic language? That's why we need these prophetic keys to unlock these things. By the way, the Old Testament prophets of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah, they talk about Babylon also, as well as uh, even as far back as uh, uh, in the books of uh, Genesis, you can find some reference there. I'll tell you more about that later. Now, we're going to go through and look at some of the identifying characteristics of this first beast. Remember, that woman is riding the same first beast you saw in Revelation 13, right? Seven heads, ten horns. First of all, just very quickly to review these things, it says that she's guilty of what? Blasphemy. Both scriptures say this beast is guilty of blasphemy. We've learned blasphemy is putting yourself in position of God or taking the prerogatives that belong to God. Now, here's a quote from a book that was a bestseller by Pope John Paul II. Um, I believe that he's a very sincere man. It's called Crossing the Threshold of Hope, but I would have to respectfully disagree with this statement. Confronted with the Pope, and this is on the opening page, confronted with the Pope, one must make a choice. The Pope is considered the man on earth who represents the Son of God, who takes the place of the second person, takes the place of the second person of the omnipotent God of the Trinity. The leader of the Catholic Church is defined by the faith as the vicar of Jesus Christ and is accepted as such by believers. Basically, it says he's here on earth to take the place of the second person of the Trinity. God the Father, first. God the Son, second. Taking the place of God the Son. I remember Jesus saying, I would send the Holy Spirit as my representative. I think it's blasphemous when a man says, I am here as the representative of Jesus. Furthermore, it says she's dressed in what color? Purple and scarlet. Purple is a color that represents royalty. And scarlet is a color represents sin. The Bible says, though the Isaiah chapter 1, though thy sins be as scarlet. Verse 5, she's called the what? The mother. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's a mother church. A woman represents a church. The term mother, now I'm reading from the Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 6, uh, 1909. The term mother church, however, as applied to Rome, has special significance as indicating its headship of all churches. Goes on now, get this, and the woman that you saw, if you have any doubts, last verse of the chapter, if you have any doubts about who this first beast is, we're now in Revelation 17, that woman that you saw is that great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. All right, help me. Who wrote the book of Revelation? Where was John the apostle when he wrote the book of Revelation? He was in Patmos. Was he there freely on vacation or was he a prisoner? Who put him there? 
Rome. Who is ruling the world? Rome. That woman that you saw is that great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. Is there any doubt when you start thinking about a woman or church that is in Rome what this beast power is? That's why I read you that litany of Bible scholars that all agreed, and these are the great minds of the church, with what I'm teaching you. I'm not teaching you anything new or original. I'm teaching you what has been lost by the church. And we're trying to rediscover our roots as a Bible people. The average Christian in North America is biblically illiterate now. If they don't get it from the radio or television preacher, they don't know what's going on. Very few people wake up and read their Bible for themselves and study their Bible comparing Scripture with Scripture. I hope these meetings are inspiring you to spend some time in Bible study. Amen, friends? In what year was the papacy predicted to lose its world influence? We've known and learned that in 1798, uh, after the French Revolution, in connection with that, General Berthier captured the Pope who died in captivity, both figuratively and literally ending the papal reign that lasted exactly 1,260 years from 538 to 1798. Which nation was predicted to arise around the same time as the papacy was receiving his deadly wound? It says in Revelation 13, verse 11 and 12, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. All right? Two horns like a lamb, and he speaks like a dragon. What country was starting out as a Christian nation like a lamb right around the time that the papacy received a deadly wound? Only one nation was being born that would become a world power that prophecy would deal with. Now, are you aware that many of the settlers that came to our country, they were not all conquistadors looking for money. Many of them that came were looking for religious freedom and toleration. And one of the first things the pilgrims did is they knelt down, they prayed, they prayed over the Bible. It was a very religious group, some of the Puritans and the ones who first landed here. What is the significance of the beast coming up out of the earth? Well, we read earlier in the prophecy, Revelation 17 tells us the waters represent a densely populated area. What new vastly um, open country was in existence at that same time period? Pound for pound, people per square mile, there was a lot of land out there. This was not densely populated civilization as they had in the Roman Empire. And they had all roads leading to Rome. In that part of the world, there were no roads in this part of the world. So it is a fulfillment of that prophecy. What is symbolized by the two lamb-like horns and then the ab absence of crowns? Notice, two horns represents the power, but there are no crowns on the horns. Have we ever had a king? Well, of course, the king of England thought he was our king, but not over. no one sat on the throne over here. It represents freedom of religion, Freedom of church, freedom of government, freedom of state. What has made this country strong is that we had a government with no king and a church with no pope. There was freedom for people to choose their government leaders and freedom for the people to choose their religion. And that's why it flourished and exploded and it was a new nation. I mean, you just read the plaque on the Statue of Liberty. Or go over here to Lincoln Memorial and read the Gettysburg Address and it reinforced, what did Lincoln say? This new nation Will it survive? It was exploding with people who are coming seeking what? Freedom. And those principles that really first found root here are now going everywhere, aren't they? Oh, and by the way, please don't interpret anything I'm saying tonight as treasonous. I love my country. I am so glad I'm an American. Again, you know, as the same way I said, I'm not trying to pick on our Catholic friends or the papacy. I'm not trying to pick on Americans. When I travel abroad, as much as I love visiting other people and meeting new people and seeing new customs and tasting new food, when Karen and I came back from Russia, we praised God for Taco Bell. <laughs> After six weeks, I mean, you just want to get down and kiss the ground. If you, if, at least that's how I feel, and maybe it's just I'm a little bit patriotic that way. But the prophecies say as much as it hurts me to say it, just as some of our Catholic friends came up after the meeting, they said, Pastor Doug, this really hurts, but we know it's true. And just as it hurts me to say it, our country is not always going to speak like a lamb. Prophecies are telling us that the devil hasn't changed. Does it mean I'm changing my citizenship? No, as long as I'm allowed to practice and preach my convictions, I'm so thankful. What does it mean when the prophecy in Revelation 13, 11 says America will speak as a dragon? Starts out like a lamb, but it says in verse... 11 of chapter 13, 
He spoke like a dragon. Who's the dragon? Represents the devil. And remember the devil in chapter 12 where the dragon appears is working through the Roman Empire. We're going to speak the same way. All right. I want to talk to you a little bit about the law. When God wrote the Ten Commandments, how many tables did he write them on? Two. As I said before, it was not because he ran out of room on one and said, I better carve another one. He did it on purpose. There is a very clear division in the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments deal very specifically with our responsibility and worship to God. The last six deal with our relationship to man, and they are civil in nature. No government should tell its constituents how to keep the first four. This is what Roger Williams started uh, the freedom of religion in our country was founded on these principles of you divide the Ten Commandments the way God divided them. You don't want to be part of a country that's telling you how to keep the first four or what you have is a totalitarian uh, dictatorship, a religious dictatorship is what you have. They're telling you how to worship. And can you compel someone to worship God? Our country is not a theocracy. You're not supposed to do that. Freedom of religion. But you don't want to be part of a country that doesn't support the last six do you want the government saying, we're going to take care of your children, the parents have no rights? Do you want the government saying, marriage, it doesn't matter? And uh, do you want the government saying, we don't care if people steal your property or kill you? I mean, of course the government has to support the last six. I'm hearing very few leaders on both sides of the question understand where to draw the line. And we've got to know when unity is great. And when you got to say, I'm drawing a line when it comes to biblical truth, I'm not compromising truth for unity. What specifically will America do that will cause it to speak as a dragon? It says in Revelation 13, verse 12, he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. When did the first beast become a beast? The church in Rome made a lot of compromises, but it wasn't until they began to use an army that Justinian had given the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, to start compelling people to worship a certain way or they'd be punished. Did Jesus ever use physical force to get people to follow him? See, it's a complete uh, detour from the principles of Christ's teaching when that happens. The church and the state will unite and enforce religious practices. That's what happened all through the Dark Ages. During the rule of the papacy from 538 to 1798, they used force to compel people to worship a certain way. When they did not cooperate, they could be tortured, they could be killed, their property could be taken away, they could be driven into the hills. Read the history about the Albigenses, the Waldenses, the Hussites. I think we've forgotten our history and someone once said, if you do that, you're doomed to repeat it. And I'll predict we're going to repeat it. The Old Testament history is being repeated right now. How does the second beast speak like a dragon? A nation speaks through its laws or its legislative body, right? It's not the superstars and the sports heroes that are speaking in behalf of the nation, are they? It's what does the government say? What are the laws? You know, I think it's very interesting. If you go to Rome, remember this. The papacy received its seat from the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire ruled by Caesars. As it began to crumble and Rome fell, at the same time it was waning, the papacy, the church, was waxing stronger. And they adopted many of the collective religions of ancient Roman Greece. The architecture of the papacy and their institutions is a lot of it is Romanesque. We, we agree with that? Have you walked around Washington, D.C. very in the very recent history? <laughs> I mean, you can see a lot of similarities between the, uh, the Capitol and the, uh, the Vatican and some of the architecture. And the second beast will make an image to the first beast that had a deadly wound and was healed. Did ancient Rome have a senate? Do we? What calendar do we use? Gregorian calendar, named after Pope Gregory. And the months, you know where they get their names? They're the Roman names for the months. They're all messed up. For instance, uh, July is named after Julius Caesar, and Augustus Caesar was bothered that Julius Caesar had more days in his month, and so he wanted a month that was just as long, so he took some days from February. And that's why August has got that, and February is so short. That's right, the Caesars did that. In the same way that ancient Rome was the undisputed leader militarily and in many other ways of the ancient world, 
Who would you say is the world leader in those respects today? The United States of America. We're going to say more about that. Over what specific issues will force be utilized and the death sentence passed? Answer, and he would cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. A death sentence if you don't worship the way you're being told. It's all dealing with what? Worship. The word worship appears many times just in chapter 13. Worship, worship, worship. And so when you hear us talk about the Sabbath truth, what is it all about? It's what God you worship and what day you worship Him. It's the one commandment that principally deals with this, the day of worship. Christianity today. Notice this, Harold Linzel. All businesses, including gasoline stations and restaurants, should close every Sunday by force of legislative fiat through the duly elected officials of the people. In other words, it should be mandated. Uh, more and more, there's voices that are speaking up saying it should be forced by the government to tell us to worship. God can't bless our country because we're not worshiping when he tells us to worship on Sunday, what they call the Lord's Day. Pat Robertson's book, The New World Order, the author there says, the next obligation that a citizen of God's world order owes to himself, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, is the command of the personal benefit of each citizen. Higher civilizations rise when people can rest and draw inspiration from God. Laws in America that mandate a day of rest, Sunday laws, have been nullified as a violation of church and state. In other words, he says it's awful how the Sunday laws have evaporated. There used to be laws in our country telling people about work on Sunday. And as an outright insult to God and His plan, only those policies that can be shown to have a clearly secular purpose are recognized. He goes on then to say, It is not the duty of any particular group of people, it is not the duty of the church, but it is the duty of the government of the people to thus proclaim as a, a day as Sabbath to be universally observed throughout the length and breadth of the land, Sunday as the Lord's Day. If we as a nation would escape the doldrums of increased trouble as God's hand rests heavily upon this people, opposition to Sunday nationally declared must cease. It needs to be supported by the government. Do you hear that? Am I reading anything into that? Maybe this is plain enough for you. I think some of us have heard of Reverend Jerry Falwell. All Americans would do well to petition the President and the Congress to make a federal law and an amendment to the Constitution, if need be, to establish the Sabbath as a national day of rest. You think he's talking about the Seventh-day Sabbath? No. And these are the sentiments that tell us which way the wind is blowing, friends. And I think we're on the verge of prophecy being fulfilled. What do you think? Could a government really control buying and selling? What does it say in Revelation 13? That those that don't worship the way they're being told to worship will not be allowed to buy and sell. Anyone here remember World War II? I mean, were you alive then? Eh, maybe you don't want to raise your hand. <laughs> I know some of our friends watching. Uh, food and gas ration stamps were a common thing. Could they control buying and selling? In times of crisis, it's very common for the government to do that. Cannot buy or sell unless he cooperates. Anyone here ever heard of economic sanctions? Keep in mind, these prophecies in Revelation are talking about government powers. And so when it says those that do not cooperate cannot buy or sell, it's not just talking about the local person who wants to go to the market with their ATM and buy something. It's talking about governments of the world that do not cooperate with this universal worship that will be forced, will be locked out economically from the new world order, whatever they're going to call it, I don't know. Is it already happening where they use economic sanctions? Yeah, and it can be devastating when they blockade. I mean, you know, the chief producers of the products of the world are the nations that buy into these two powers. Europe, North America, even Australia is tied into Europe. They recognize the queen, right? And just about every other country in the world is some way tied into one of these powers. How strong and influential is the papacy today? Now, here are some amazing quotes. Some of you remember when this came out in Time magazine that after Reagan's tenure as president, it was revealed that he did conspire with Pope John Paul II. It was called the Holy Alliance. They worked to undermine the communism and quite successfully. This is from Carl Bernstein in that article. Reagan and the Pope agreed to undertake a clandestine campaign to hasten the dissolution of the communist empire. They started in Poland with the solidarity. Some of you remember Lech Walesa. And it was a conspiracy to bring down communism. Did it work? 
Are they powerful? Is the papacy in the United States a powerful entity to consider? It goes on to say, uh, the U.S. ambassador to the Vatican, Thomas P. Medley, I believe the United States as the world's only superpower and the Holy See, that's the papacy, as the only worldwide moral political sovereignty have, signif have significant roles to play in the future. Their actions will impact the lives of people in all parts of the globe. And I think we've made a strong case for that. And I could just show you one picture after another of the presidents all the way back from uh, JFK to the present meeting with Pope John Paul II or Pope uh, Paul. Um, so, this uh, union stretching across the abyss, is it happening? I think we've seen it very clearly. How strong and influential is the United States today? The second beast, does it have the power to urge other countries to cooperate? Yeah, first of all, just consider for a minute. Economically, Wall Street is the dynamo of the economy of the world. Computer technology, medical technology, and you can go right down the line for the, the great methods of communication. It's the center for those things, the very powerful influences. What about military might? Would we agree that while we may not have the greatest number of soldiers, the technology and the power of the weapons possessed by the United States is unsurpassed. And with the breakup of the Soviet Union, and they don't have that consolidation that they had before, uh, and even since the first Gulf War, America has pretty much been recognized by the world as the ultimate superpower. And everybody's looking to us now to help police what's happening everywhere in the world. Is it clear that the influence and power of both the United States and the papacy are escalating with rapidity? What other factors could possibly help set the stage for a worldwide law to execute those who refuse to violate conscience? What does it say in Luke 21, verse 25? And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things that are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then it goes on to say, and then they'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. Something's going to happen, signs in the sun and the moon, men's hearts failing for fear. Something is going to frighten. Will it be an economic collapse? I think that'll probably be part of it. Might be a terrorist act, could be a natural disaster. As world conditions worsen, what will Satan do to deceive the masses? Answer, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles that go out under the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Didn't the Lord tell us there will be false Christs? There'll be real prophets in the last days and false ones. Jesus is going to pour out His Spirit, but they'll be counterfeit. God came to the earth in the form of a man to save us. The devil is going to counterfeit that. Amen? They'll show great signs and wonders. Whereas if it's possible to deceive even the very elect, it will be so compelling and so convincing. Friends, how are you going to not be deceived? How can we prevent it? Answer, Isaiah 8, verse 20. According to the law and the testimony, the law and the prophets, the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus, the Bible, that's the only way we're going to know. Amen, friends? Amen. He goes on to say, if they don't go by the law and the testimony, there is no light in them. Finally, Revelation 3, verse 10. There's a promise for you. Write that down, friends. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will keep you from the hour of trial that will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Do you want God to keep you? It says, keep his commands. Don't lose the patience of the saints. You don't need to be afraid, friends, of what is coming. We can have peace during this time. We are living on the threshold of the end right now. And that's why God has brought you. He wants you to know he has a big plan for your life. He's got an eternal plan for your life. But ultimately, that comes from first accepting Jesus, the Prince of Peace, into your heart.